Hey Freunde der Energie-Server, ähm, Sili, Sili Gurke ist mal wieder hier am Start äh, auf Lasergurkenland, der Energie-Server mit momentan 20 Slots und 0 Spielern, äh, 0 aktiven Spielern, ja okay, vielleicht was, was heißt aktiv, hin und wieder, vielleicht haben wir täglich 1, 2, 3, okay sagen wir, ah, ich würde mal so schätzen, 1 bis 2 User täglich circa ähm, online für kurze Zeit, ähm, die IP-Adresse ist 149.202.187.134. Ähm, wenn ihr dieses Video in 2025 seht und so, wow, das ist ja noch von 2020, das Server ist sicher nicht mehr online. Äh, vielleicht geht die IP dann nicht mehr und es ist noch die Domain silihun.com verfügbar. Aber es ist sehr, sehr, sehr wahrscheinlich, dass der Server in den, innerhalb der nächsten fünf äh, Jahre noch online ist. Bei zehn Jahren bin ich mir echt gar nicht so sicher, aber fünf Jahre ist eigentlich eine recht sichere Sache. Ähm, eventuell ändert sich auch die Domain und die IP, aber dann äh, wird es in der Beschreibung vermutlich aktualisiert. Ähm, dann würde ich sagen, treten wir mal bei, es ist ein Anarchie-Server ohne, ohne Regeln und wir schauen ähm, jetzt weiter auf dem Brian Clough Channel ähm, das, äh, den, den Talk von Aaron Jones, Introduction to Reds, Remote Access Trojan Tool. Da haben wir in der Folge davor schon 24 Minuten und 40 Sekunden geschaut. Oder waren es 25 Minuten oder 24, das weiß ich gerade nicht. Ähm, auf jeden Fall geht es da jetzt weiter. Oftentimes you'll see that it's sort of sensationalized in the news. Somebody will get up and they'll talk about different keywords and they'll tell you about all kinds of horrible things that have happened and they'll try to make it sound like a really, really big deal. But really what it came down to was somebody sent an email or a link or a file and somebody else clicked on it. That's, that's the whole thing. Now, that in-between part between the creation of that file and somebody clicking on it, that's where your social engineering is happening. And oftentimes it's not even the same person doing that. Somebody will make the attack. Somebody else will assist in delivery. Somebody else will work on exfiltration or gaining something from the attack. And then of course, what's left for us, but to pick up the pieces and to try to recover. So they used .zip files. And if you actually follow along and go through, I have a method in here that's linked that allows you to take a payload and just put it into a zip file. So this is not sophisticated stuff. It's not difficult. I have all of the links included right here that goes from, okay, here's my malware, here's the file, here's how we put both of them together, and now it's just a thing that has to be passed off to somebody else. French companies. Here's another one. Again, another aggressive social engineering campaign. I like how they use the word aggressive, but really what it comes down to is somebody actually took time. That's what this is. Because everybody here has heard of the Nigerian scam, correct? And what does that consist of? You take and make an email, and you make what amounts to a wild and outlandish claim. I'm a king or a prince. I've been disposed from my kingdom. I've got billions, if not millions, if not trillions of dollars, and I want to give it all to you. So you're going to have to give me a little bit of money. And how many people still clicked, still replied, still participated, and still allowed everything that was in there that would be a red flag to, I would believe, every single person inside this room? Any of us would look at that and go, I don't think you're a friend. I don't think you have billions of dollars. And why would you email me? But they still fall for it. So the delivery and the, the act Gerade of getting schon this user number eins people, here. that's not hard. <coughs> ABC, right? Always be clicking. That's what Oder wahrscheinlich do. mittlerweile schon user Nummer zwei heute. You just hand them something and they click on it. So They'll touch it. They'll open it. Even if the box says, hey, this is obviously bait, it's a trap, it's going to hurt you, and they'll still put their finger in it. So what this comes down to is, There are individuals who actually sit down and they start going through social media. And we're going to have a social media class at some point where we're going to discuss how some of this open source intelligence gathering begins. But really what it starts with is Google and maybe your other 
favorite search engines. It starts with names, and it's just the act of pivoting. And when I say pivoting, what I really mean is, so let's say that you see in the news that there's a business, and that business is in the current state of being bought out by another company. So anybody who has worked in business would be able to tell you that's generally a fairly stressful time, right? There's people running around, there's new people showing up, people don't know other people, there's confusion. And that confusion is opportunity for criminals. That's what it is. All confusion becomes opportunity. So these individuals will find out about these companies, and they will look, and then they will go through LinkedIn, and they will find out who has a position of power, who has access to money. So you're looking for what? Different COs, right? You're looking for different people that you know have specific capabilities. And then maybe you even go in and you pay an employee or you wine and dine an employee, somebody else that you found on social media, just to find out what's really going on. Oh, yeah. Susan in accounting, she cuts all the checks. Oh, really? Susan in accounting, who's that? And then you build your information on them. And if you don't think this is happening, it does. It happens every day. People will build detailed accounts of what's going on in the company based off of social media, based off of uh, YouTube, based off of all of that. For those of you who took the Showdown class, what did I do? Uh, I talked about how in YouTube, I found a video, right? And then I looked at the computer in the background. And from that computer in the background, what was I able to see? I was able to see information about the graphical user interface that they use for their programs for a DOD project. And then from there, I typed that into Shodan, and then I was able to locate the servers that would be involved in that. All because somebody decided to do a news interview. So all it is is pivoting from information. Somebody put up information, and they leaked something else in the background within the metadata, and then from there you pivot, and you pivot, and you pivot, and you pivot, and you move, until you've gathered enough information to be able to execute your attack. Now, sometimes it's harder, and sometimes it's easier. And it depends on how well-educated the group is that you're actually targeting, okay? Because I have had to deal with individuals who, for all intents and purposes, when I looked at them, did not feel that young girls between the ages of 20 and 25 wearing bikinis would be interested in those people. But those individuals felt that those young ladies would actually be interested in them and were ABC, always be clicking. And so they were able to fall for nothing more than a person with a pretty picture on social media sending them a link and saying, hey, will you click this? Come check out my pictures because I'm a hot girl. I would doubt at this moment that any of those people that were behind those posts were even girls. Okay? But when I was explaining that to them, they looked at me like that was insane, like they couldn't believe that. Nobody would do that. Who would take a picture of a very hot girl and add a whole bunch of stuff about how, hey, come look at me on cam, and I want to talk to you, and you're so hot, and this and that, and then send that to them? Who would do that? Mm -hmm. But it's a shotgun blast to get as many people as they possibly can, and guess what? People still click. They still click. You can't stop them. But in addition to that, not only are we talking about the digital stuff that I kind of touched on, uh, some of the physical, but we have phone calls. You know, good research, a phone call, and it's as easy as explaining something. I was reading about a gentleman who was very heavily involved in the swatting scene, and what he would do was he would find out the IP address for his target, and he would call their service provider, and then he would pretend like his computer didn't work in the call center. And he would pretend like he was in the call center with the person that he was on the phone with to get them to give him information about accounts. And he had gotten to the point where he could literally sit there and imagine what their computer screen looked like because he had been in their network so many times. And he would have to work some of these individuals through how to use their own computers at their job. Go here, click here. Now put in this IP address. Now hit enter. Oh yeah, yeah, I know it's slow. We'll wait, don't worry. And at the end of it all, he ended up with all of the information that he needed to be able to execute an attack on somebody simply by pretending to be an employee at an internet service provider. Yeah, so the sophistication, really what it boils down to is, 
Are you a good liar? Can you lie to people? Yes or no? And most people can when you really get to that point. Uh, I watched a, a lady who also did this. And the way that she got around it was her skill level and her technical expertise wasn't that high. But what she would do would she would turn on the sound of a crying baby in the background. Classic. And then she would just act frantic. And I'm in a hurry, and I don't know what to do, and I, I just I worry my husband's going to be so upset, and blah, blah, blah. And by the time she was done, the person on the other line was so willing and wanting to help that they just gave tons of information to her. And she was able to change people's uh, ownership for their phones. She was able to change the ownership of the internet. She could go in and turn people's water off. She was capable of doing each one of these things, and really what it came down to was a sound bite of a crying baby. Because what do people normally want to do, especially when you're at a call center? What are you told to do? What's your number one priority? Help the customer. Or that. I guess it depends. Don't work at your call center. 2021, that's not wonderful. You know, some people would say that, but for many of those folks, for a long time, it wasn't even trained. You know, people don't even think about the fact that somebody could be potentially calling to cause harm. And so nowadays, and only very recently, they're starting to tell people, hey, potentially this person on the other end of the line, they could be somebody dangerous, or they could be doing something bad. I had a student who worked uh, for a uh, phone provider. They sold cell phones. And he told me that for the longest time, they had no logs on what he was doing. And it was only until very recently that they started actually auditing what was going on, what accounts he was looking at, and things like that. Because the, the, the whole business idea was to get as many people just off the line as quickly as possible, just help them. So if they called up and they said the correct words and they knew what to say, then he was going to help. And so only very recently have we moved to, hey, you've got to actually protect stuff. And a lot of that comes from attacks on celebrities. Uh, we can go all the way back to, so favorite story, and this has, this this goes with our uh, social engineering. Who's the most famous dog in cybersecurity? Does anybody know the world's favorite? You've taken my class. <laughs> go ahead, tell me. Tinkerbell. 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 Tinkerbell is the world's most famous dog in cybersecurity. And if you didn't know that, the reason why Tinkerbell is the most famous Tinkerbell. dog in cybersecurity is because that was Paris Hilton's dog. Uh, and do you know what Paris Hilton's password was on uh, her T-Mobile account? Uh, Teacher Bell. <laughs> Close. So what somebody did was they picked up the phone and pretended to be Paris Hilton. And when asked, what is your password? They said, what's my hint? And they said, it's your dog. And they said, oh, is it Tinkerbell? Hmm. And my understanding is it was a male who made this phone call. Okay, so keep this in mind. Uh, and they said yes. And so this person pulled oh shit, so viele Leute habe ich hier noch nie Leute, man. Ja, habe ich nicht am Anfang des Videos noch gesagt, maximal 1 2 3 Leute pro Tag hier und jetzt haben wir vier Leute auf einmal hier und ich bin auch noch da. Ähm, äh, ne? Also so viele Leute auf einmal habe ich hier tatsächlich noch nie gesehen. Ähm und wir sind jetzt literally direkt am Spawn. Ich habe echt Schiss, dass ich hier weggesnackt werde. Aber let's go. Transferred to a new SIM card. So, what did they get? Contacts, they got phone calls, they got everything. And so this individual, that was sort of patient zero in terms of all of these attacks on celebrities. Because her phone was vulnerable, she got hit, And the next thing you know, they hit Snoop Dogg, they hit uh, tons of other musicians, they, they just plowed through celebrities. And to this day, they have a severe issue with these celebrities being swatted constantly. Like, it's non-stop. But that was patient zero, right there. Was that initial attack on pa Paris Hilton with the world's most famous cybersecurity dog, which is Tinkerbell. So... Okay. If talking to people is not your thing. Ich habe keine Ahnung, was da los ist. Vielleicht ist das irgendeine Gang. Where you don't feel comfortable with that, then we can also move on to browser exploits. Because Aber mittlerweile ist es echt 
But everybody knows here but, that I picked Leute, on what the fuck? a lot of browser. Jesus, ich, äh, ich habe echt Schiss mittlerweile. So viele Leute, wie gerade online sind, da muss doch jemand ins Spawn hier sein mittlerweile, oder? Oh, Schäsel. Ich weiß, ich weiß echt nicht. Also ich spiele jetzt nicht so viel. Ich dachte eigentlich in letzter Zeit schon viel. Seht ihr, ich habe ja, was ist das Folge? 60 hier, 60 Folgen hier schon äh, gespielt. Ähm oh nein! Ich wollte eigentlich zur Slime Farm, fällt mir gerade auf, aber die erreicht man ja über den Nether. Und den Nether erreicht man nicht mehr wirklich. Oh, das ist eine kritische Nummer. Okay. Ja, da muss ich mal schauen. Ich denke hier einfach hier weit weg und dann. Ich möchte mit der CDE Und das ist ein 2016 CDE für Internet Explorer, as well as a few other items. But the reason why I picked this one is because oftentimes when you start going through CDEs, you will see v similar e. to, <laughs> and then it will list this exploit here. Okay? So even though there are newer exploits, many of them will come back and say this. This is very similar. So I give this one to you to take a look at. But really, what is it? Because of JavaScript and Visual Basic Script, the ones that are actually sent out in Internet Explorer, what does it allow you to do? You have the ability to execute arbitrary code or cause a denial of service, aka memory corruption, via a crafted website. So if you take a web page and you put a little JavaScript in it, and then you give somebody that link, then you can cause things to happen in their browser. Now, the complaint has been made that I complain a lot about JavaScript. And I do, because I hate JavaScript. I'm a e-links and a gopher kind of guy. Like, if we could go back to gopher, that I'd be good. But we can't, so we're stuck with what we've got. So, they're constantly pushing fixes for every single browser that you can imagine. Whether you're using the Tor browser, Firefox, Chrome, Chromium. Uh, the only one that I know hasn't had a CD that came out in a long time is eLinks. I'm just put that out there. So uh, that's, that's been a long time since they put a CD out on that. If you're using a browser, you're probably vulnerable. Let's just, let's just get right with that, okay? If you're on the internet and you have a browser, you're vulnerable. In addition to that, everybody knows tools like, what, Microsoft Outlook? So the email system, that vulnerable. There are methods by which you can deploy code. And it's funny to me that you would be able to craft an email that has JavaScript in it that would allow you to run scripts through something that would actually interpret it. That seems sort of foreign and weird to me. I don't know what kind of script that you would want to send out in an email, but those were capabilities. Mm -hmm. And then I don't even want to get started out on ActiveX, but that was another issue where They constantly attempt to expose a very dangerous footprint directly from the browser where you're dealing oh, with Stone Age. Das sind alles noch Neulinge, aber And that seems to be a thing denn? that we're constantly pushing for. And when I say we, I just mean the technology. Mein Stone with your new pickaxes. Die müssen doch dann echt noch spawn nähe sein, wenn die gerade erst gejoint sind, oder? One particular um, operating system. None of that. It doesn't have anything to do with your user land. What this has to do with is the idea that we're going to take these web browsers and we're just going to expose them to a massive scripting footprint where people are allowed to run code that we haven't inspected on our systems over the internet. It seems strange to me, but that's what we do. So of course, exploiting the browser is a popular and traditional method of deploying a rat. Uh, this is also one of the big ones that constantly hits like World of Warcraft players and other people who play online games. Uh, they'll go to a web page that has ads that are ser serving up uh, malware, and then a couple of days later they try to log into the World of Warcraft account or other gaming account, and the next thing they know their username and their password has been stolen because they were able to deploy a keylogger while the browser was open. Now that was sort of circa five, six years ago-ish. 
uh, Wrath of the Lich King, if that helps you, if you want to kind of get when that came out. But right around there was when people would go to these, I don't want to call them cheat sites, but they were informational sites uh, about their game. And while they're there, they would minimize sites. the browser, and the entire time the browser was actually logging their keys, and they would log into their game, and then people mm. would just try the passwords that were being entered and get in and steal like their gold and their items and so on and so forth. Now, of course, there's also malware as, as a service. And there's the rig exploit kit. Uh, in addition to that, I okay, have Okay, das war wohl irgendwo eine Partytruppe, die hier kurz vorbeigeschaut hat. Also, es ist nicht die, nicht die Regel hier, dass... Uh, and they have a list of... Eigentlich ist hier immer mindestens, Again, mindestens 18 Rig, Slots frei. Uh, they list Grand Soft. There are different companies that will actually sell you pre-built exploits that also come along with payloads. So when you start messing with these uh, rats and you can't figure out a way of getting it onto a system, oftentimes you can go in and you can pay these companies and they run the command and control system. They give you access to the computers. Oftentimes they'll have a guarantee that we will, ex uh, we will infect X number of computers. So you pay this much money and then at that point they will tell you, okay, well we're going to run a malware campaign for you that will gain you access to let's say 200 computers and will guarantee you that you'll have those 200 computers for X amount of time. And then oftentimes in addition to that one of the ways they sweeten the pot in a way is they'll over deliver. So they'll tell you yes you pay us X amount of money we'll give you 200 computers and you'll have access to this for X amount of months but then they'll maybe over deliver by giving you an extra month and 250 computers instead. And it's all just paid. Now Something to keep in mind is they don't care about you and you can find numerous times where other people have broken into these systems and then dumped the uh, customer base. So people go in and they buy this malware as a service and they use it and then somebody decides that they're pissed off about that and they go in and they break into the command and control system for that malware and then go out and pull the database for all of the users. They pull emails, they pull information, they attempt to dox those users. If you're not familiar with the term dox, it's shorthand for documents, and what they're really trying to do is identify who you are, okay? And so they will dox those users and try to get all of that information, and then they'll use it for a campaign of their own. And uh, that is not unheard of for there to be acts of revenge in terms of, okay, you're using this malware or you're involved with these people and then somebody else is going to come in and they're going to kick in your digital door. And we'll get to that as well because I've got some really great examples of that happening. Let's start with Trojan horses because Trojans are relatively easy to, to build. They're quite simple and there's tons of different ways of being able to do this. Uh, of course the easiest method that I know of is on Android. Uh, if you can find a popular application, Flappy Bird, uh, you can then take that APK down, and you can actually just add the rat directly to the code. Now, we we'll pause here, because a comment was made to me, and I've been through some job interviews and things like that, and so I really want to express this, just in case somebody who's like a hiring manager is watching this, because this is kind of important. Cyber security is multifaceted. Now, a whole bunch of us in here are probably thinking to yourself, well, yeah, if you're working in cybersecurity, you probably work with Python, and maybe you have a uh, maybe you have a hardware firewall that you work on, and then in addition to that, you're dealing with networking stuff, and then in addition to that, you have system administration tasks. You have a whole bunch of dots that you have to connect throughout the day. So, oftentimes, what I'll see is somebody will come to me. Case in point, I had a person who was talking to me, and the question was posed, how dangerous are you? I thought, that's a weird question to ask. Why would you ask that? Uh, and I, I laughed, and I kind of like tried to dance around the subject. Like, well, I mean, I know, I would rate myself as intermediate with computers. Like, I'm not, not the world's greatest, not the world's worst. Like, I'm not ABC, okay? Not always be clicking. But 
the question kept getting posed, well, I really need to know how dangerous you are. And so finally I was like, well, okay, I mean, maybe, maybe they're working on some kind of project that I don't know about, and mm. this is a thing. And so I started telling them about my resume and some of the training I've been through and, and some of my capabilities and some of the things that I've gone to, the, to, to different places to train on. And I was like, well, these are a rather large host of abilities that I have. Does any of this make sense to you? And they looked at it, and the guy, I, he like wasn't so jolly anymore. And it really, his answer was, well, I was like, do you know how to use malware bite? And at that point, I, I knew the whole thing was over. But when I'm, when you're out there and you're dealing with these folks, many of them, they don't have like a concept. There's, there's sort of this like bro security attitude box that everybody gets thrown into. And then you're sort of like trying to claw your way out. That's how it feels to me. So, yes, when you're looking at this stuff, you have to understand how to do some computer programming. You need to understand how to use GDB. Maybe you need to be able to compile something. Maybe you need to deal with Python. Maybe there's a language that you don't like right now that you think about and you just think, oh, if I ever have to work on that language, I would quit my job. But maybe you need to think about like taking the time to at least learn the basics of that language because potentially somebody has weaponized it and it's something that you're going to see someday. Okay? So this becomes one of those multifaceted journeys where I don't have an Android phone. And if it was up to me, I'd have a flip phone. Actually, if it was up to me, I would have a T-Mobile sidekick. But that's gone. So don't get confused when I put up here that, yes, you're going to have to learn how to take Java and add it to another application and then recompile that and turn it into an APK. Because that's how you're going to get something like this onto a free Android market. That's how these tools are going to get deployed. That's how other people are deploying them. So potentially, if somebody were to come to you and they have an Android phone and it is suffering from an infection, what may be one of the first things that you're going to want to look for on that phone? Flappy Birds. Flappy Bird, <laughs> sure. But how did they get Flappy Bird? Anything side loaded. Side loaded? Absolutely. So do you side load? Do they even know what that term is? Do you ask them about that? Or do you maybe take a look at the phone and see if they're using some of those alternative uh, Android markets? So there's tons of alternative Android markets, and some of them are better curated than others. Mm. And so that's what you start looking for the portal, the yeah, and You have to know and understand whenever oh, you're sitting there working on your network, here and and your system system up this land farm. Oh, no. potentially the pivot point is off of an Android phone, and the pivot point off of that Android phone is off of a free Android market that somebody put down because Pivot Point, they saw a ad that was a malware related ad that told them that you could get free pictures of some girl that they wanted just by going to a specific web page. Like each one of those moments is a step that somebody took that ultimately ended up in you having to spend that evening going through logs. Yep. The first thing you have to remove from any Android phone is Cortana. Cortana come on Android? Uh, I think you'd be surprised how often it's on it. Really? Okay. Uh, so let's start on Windows again, because I'm going to beat up on them a little bit more. And the reason why oh, I want to do that is because what do we train most of our users? Is. If you saw .exe, what do you do? We can then press. noch zerlegen, aber that's mal sehen. generally our training. Most people are told. If you have a .exe file, that's a .executable, and that's a bad thing. And so, since we train most people on not clicking .exes, how do they get around that? Well, how about right to left override? This one's pretty popular. Anybody heard of this out here? No? Awesome. So I got a room full of people that I'm teaching something to. This is fantastic. So the right to left override. Let's start by getting our rat.exe file, and you can throw that on your desktop if you want to. And then go ahead and hit that Windows key and just type in Windows Character Map. And if you type in Windows Character Map, what that will bring you up is a digital keyboard. And so for those of you who don't know, modern keyboards and modern text entry on computers isn't really like it used to be back in like the 80s. Like we had so many characters that we could use and uh, 
Uh, maybe there were some symbols and things like that. Nowadays, there's a lot of actual actions that you can take with your keyboard that don't necessarily seem like something that you would normally ever need to do. So once yeah. you open that Windows character it's not map, intact. Woo! There is a character Was? that is a right to He's left not alles line. intact. And what that means oh is my once God. you put this in, the system no longer... Äh. <laughs> Vielleicht sollte ich dieses Video nicht hochladen und hoffen, ne egal, das, die, der eine Zuschauer oder der eine Klick, den das Video kriegt, da findet das... Hä, aber als ob die Base da vorne geradet wurde und dann hier nicht... Hä? Wie, wie lucky ist das denn? Das ist ja der Hammer. Oh mein Gott! Types from left to right, it types right to left. Uh, there are <gasps> what? Mending! That you read oh. right to left, correct? Everybody sort of familiar with that? Yeah, but kind of sure, protection, but mending. Absolutely. So, what you're doing oh. is you're telling the keyboard from here on out, I want you to type in the opposite direction. Das kann man doch da wieder abziehen, so now von, we're going to right click on that file and we're going to choose read. Okay, ich muss kurz Pause machen, weil das ist mir gerade echt zu spannend hier. Ähm, um, huiuiui. Ich fühle mich, als würde ich mich selber ausrauben. Mache ich ja. Achso, ja, für die Leute, die nicht wissen, was das hier ist, und ich habe es nicht durch Zufall gefunden, ähm, der Server war circa drei Jahre lang äh, privat, also nicht öffentlich, und da habe ich hier mit ein paar Freunden und so gespielt. Und ähm, in der Zeit haben wir hier dieses Lime Farm aufgebaut. Na ähm, ja gut, das war eigentlich nur ich. Also... Wir waren eher vorne da, wo dieser ganze Lavakrater war und so. Da haben wir mit unserer Gang dieses Dings aufgebaut und ich habe hier nebenbei noch dieses Slime Farm aufgezogen. Und ähm, deswegen weiß ich, dass die hier ist. Und dann, als der, als ich den Server veröffentlicht habe und einen einer hieß Server draus gemacht habe, wurde unsere Base, obwohl sie doch ein bisschen weit weg ist, äh, direkt eigentlich gefunden nach nach wenigen Tagen nur und direkt komplett zerlegt. Und ähm, dann äh, bin ich auch geflohen und äh, meine ganzen Mates hatten davor eigentlich schon gar keinen Bock mehr auf dem Server zu spielen. Ich habe davor auch lange nicht mehr hier gespielt. Und ähm, genau so war das. Und dementsprechend ähm, hatte ich gehofft, hier noch ein bisschen Slime zu finden, weil ich wollte ein paar Sachen mit, äh, mit Redstone machen, ein bisschen mit, mit Slime und so, ohne wieder ein ganzes Loch ausheben zu müssen. Und hatte ich gehofft, dass wenigstens hier noch ein Krater übrig bleibt und ähm, ich damit was anfangen kann. Aber hier ist tatsächlich nicht nur ein Krater übrig geblieben, sondern die ganze, die ganze Farm ist noch intakt. Und damals waren wir super rich. Wir hatten einen Villager, mit, äh, der uns Mending getradet hat gegen Papier und wir hatten fette Sugarcane Farmen. Also wir hatten nicht so viele Mending Bücher, wie wir wollten. Oder gegen, nicht Papier, gegen Emeralds, aber die Emeralds haben wir gegen Papier getauscht und so weiter. Also, ähm, das war, äh, ja, wir waren damals einfach, wir waren reich und ähm, Full Mending und äh, Elytra und ja, es war halt schon, es war Early Endgame, würde ich sagen, was wir da gespielt haben. Und, ähm, ja. Und das ist eben noch ein Überbleibsel der Out des Outposts und ähm, ist natürlich herrlich. Jetzt als Nomade und alleine ist es natürlich schwierig, sich so ein Reichtum wieder aufzubauen. Vor allem, weil ich irgendwie gar keinen Bock habe auf so Villager-Kram und so. Da hat sich ein Mate äh, von mir drum gekümmert und ähm, ja, äh, genau. Und deswegen... Äh, bin ich voll in Ek Ekstase hier in dieser Base. Ähm, und hier liegen so Sachen wie dieses äh, wie diese Mending-Rüstung einfach nur so rum, weil es halt so ein Abfall eigentlich war. Weil, naja, die hat nicht mal Protection drauf. Also das ist voll das useless Teil. Mann, hey, es ist, ist fun hier. Es ist richtig, richtig nostalgisch hierher zurückzukehren. Also wenn das jetzt noch ein geiler Villager gewesen wäre, wäre natürlich... Äh, Natürlich eine starke Sache gewesen. Oh mein Gott, what is this place? Ähm, ja, geil. Das, also ich wirklich, nach ein paar Tagen direkt wurde äh, die 
unsere Base gefunden. Und ein bisschen, wenn man ein bisschen weiter geht äh, in der Base, dann findet man das Teil hier. Und das haben wir auch gesehen. Da vorne war die Kiste zerstört. Äh, das wurde auch gefunden. Aber dann wurde die, die paar Meter den Gang nicht mehr entlang gegangen, um diese Goldgrube hier noch zu finden. Also... Ehre auf jeden Fall an die Person, die das verklatscht hat, da noch vorbeizuschauen. Ja, ich weiß nicht, die ganzen Enderpearls, die kann ich halt nicht mittransportieren, ne? Also. So, und das ist, ja, ist ganz nett, aber ist jetzt auch nicht, obwohl... Eigentlich bin ich so pur unterwegs, dass ich es mal gegen gegen die Eier eintauschen kann. Ja, ich nehme ich nehm jeden Diamanten, den ich kriegen kann. So. Und ähm, ja. Ja, krass. Also krasse Sache. Richtig krasse Sache. Name. And then just put your mouse right before the extension and paste that right to left character because you were able to pull it off of that keyboard. So you were able to put it into that digital keyboard and copy it and then you're going to paste it. Once you've done that, you can then type in 3PM and hit enter right at the end of the extension and now the system will actually look like MP3. So when a person is looking at the file instead of seeing .exe, what they'll actually see is .mp3. And then, so this right here is a very simple, very basic way of creating a file that somebody would look at, and if they've been trained on the NBC, never be clicking, .exe files, they may click on this, because now it's an MP3 file. Now, of course, taking a step back here, what do we need to do? We need a story, right? Hey, Janice and accounting. Okay, so, um, dann sind wir... Dann sind wir echt tatsächlich hier voll. Ich bin immer noch am Gunpowder sammeln für die Elytra, aber ich habe ja nicht mal mehr eine Elytra, also von daher, I don't know. I do not know. Gibt es hier irgendwas, was man noch brauchen kann? Eigentlich habe ich richtig Bock, hier eine Falle hinzubauen, weil der nächste Keck, der hier vorbeikommt und das kaputt machen will, sollte eigentlich sterben. Wenn ich hier, hier oben schon so eine Trap Chest mit TNT oder so, das könnte die Slime Farm noch ein bisschen länger am Leben halten. Wäre eigentlich mal eine, eine gute Idee. Und vielleicht sollte man auch dieses Not a Slime Chunk äh, Schild hier wegmachen, damit die Leute nicht checken. Naja gut, die werden schon checken, dass es eine Slime Farm ist und das dann nicht zerstören. Ja, ähm, genau. Gibt es hier irgendwas? Ja, Lapis Lazuli ist natürlich stark, immer stark. Äh, Eimer, geil. Holz, uh, das muss man echt mitnehmen. Holz ist eigentlich richtig geil. Ja, sonst... Sonst ist hier nichts. Dann hoffen wir, dass wir noch ein bisschen Slime finden. Also ein Stack Slime-Blöcke würde ich schon gerne mitnehmen. Ähm, sonst kann man hier natürlich auch noch ein bisschen warten, weil es kann halt echt sein, dass das das letzte Mal ist, dass ich diese Slime-Farm funktional äh, finde. Oh shit, die sind leer, die Kisten. Oh. Ja, hier kann man noch eine AFK-Nummer schieben eigentlich. Uh, dünne Sache, ja. Ja, acht Blöcke. Die Frage ist halt auch, uh, die sind transparent, das ist neu. Ähm, die Frage ist auch, welchen Slot, ja gut, den Wolle-Slot. Ja, natürlich. Den Wolleslot dafür eintraden. Das ist eine klare Sache. Ja, und diese Cartography. Ah ja. Okay. 
sieht. Ich bin eh am rumwandern. Also ich werde wahrscheinlich noch genug Dörfer finden mit so einem Kram drinnen. Also von daher ist es halt echt nicht so wertvoll eigentlich. Ähm Wobei, ich bin jetzt fast 50 Folgen rumgewandert. Äh, wie, wie war jetzt 200.000 Blöcke? Und ich habe drei davon gefunden. Also die sind doch in einer gewissen Weise ein bisschen selten. Aber ich habe es auch nicht danach gesucht. Also, ja. Whatever. Ja, krass. This is blah 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 and I work with so and so and you might not know him because he works in this very very compartmentalized area. Uh, I just want to let you know that uh, I've got this file that I need you to listen to because it's got some instructions and we've decided to record that file instead of type it all out because it's kind of long. So if you could just click on that for me, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, it'll give you some instructions about what you need to do. And maybe they click on it. And then it comes up and it doesn't do anything, or maybe it launches uh, DLC. But really, what you're doing is you're adding a rat to the system, and you're executing that because you've wrapped that rat in another actual real application. You'll also see this done with Putty. Is everybody familiar with Putty? This is another one that you'll see in the wild. Somebody will take a, a copy of Putty and they will inject a rat into Putty, and then they will distribute that copy of Putty. And then people will click on Putty, Putty will open, but the whole mm. time the Putty is running, there's a rat running in the background. And that's how ja, another way that they will gain access Windows, to the system. Ne? Windows hat ja mittlerweile auch uh, OpenSSH installiert. Da muss man kein Putty mehr installieren. And oftentimes that's targeted at people who are a little bit more advanced. Oh mein level, Gott, das habe ich ja ganz vergessen, das Teil hier. Install Putty, oh. so obviously you probably have to. Leute, <laughs> ist der funktional? Ist es fertig? Äh, warte, wie geht denn das? Ich habe keine Ahnung, wie das da funktioniert. Was fehlt denn da? Das ist doch vollkommen, oder muss da noch eine Linie tiefer? Hä, äh, was checke ich denn da nicht? Wieso ist denn der nicht an? Äh, aber krass. Das ist ja absoluter Jackpot hier. Oh Gott, wie kriege ich denn das Teil abgebaut? Leute, ich habe dieses Teil vergessen. <lacht> äh, irgendwie habe ich Bock, das stehen zu lassen, das anzuwerfen, weil ich glaube, das war nie an. Oder muss, muss das da oben frei sein, damit das funktioniert? Nee, oder? Ich glaube das mal kurz aus, glaube ich. Ich sollte wahrscheinlich jetzt nicht die Koordinaten in den Chat schreiben. 1, 3, 1 und 5, 5, 5, 8. Oh Gott, das merke ich mir nie. Wo komme ich denn schnell an die Oberfläche? Hm. Welche ist es immer am Rand? Ne? Oh. Wahrscheinlich macht das auch keinen Sinn, dann sollte er so sein. Ja. Mit higher skill set or skill level than your average user, but they still need to be able to infect your system. So Putty, another really good target. And that also comes from the way that Putty is deployed. You go to this like really janky 1990s webpage, unless they've changed it. Haven't seen the Putty still site. Janky. Still janky? Okay, perfect. Yeah, so you go to this really janky 1990s webpage to download a copy of Putty. That doesn't take anything to w get that, pull down the whole site, edit it, make a copy, and then push that up somewhere and get people to click on that. I can think of a million ways of being able to accomplish that. So that is a method right there, being able to spoof an extension and take an exe and turn it into an mp3 file. But it still functions. Here's 
a script that I have added. And this script is called Backdoor PowerPoint. And this is just an Office spoof extension tool. And really what it does is it automates that method of sitting there and having to do all of this by hand using copy and paste and all that. But here's a script that will run directly off your shelf in order to take different EXE files and turn those into things that look like PowerPoints, into doc files, into other payloads. Okay? So if all you need to be able to do is take your EXE and convert that into looking like something else, this will do it. Uh, and of course it comes with Tally and different Tally based distros. Uh, they have a video tutorial on exactly how to use this. This is all very detailed. And this is something that I've noticed. I don't want to call it honor among thieves, but something that I've seen as I've gone through and I've done research on each of these different tools is people are very, very open with what they do and how they do it. And we're going to get a little bit further on here in just a minute where we'll start to get to videos where people actually show themselves breaking into different stuff. And so if you want to take like an afternoon one day of going through and just watching video after video after video of people being exploited and attacks being delivered and different payloads being created, I've got a ton of resources here for you in a little bit. But they will come out and they will show you these things. Um, there are different forums. I'm not going to go over any of the forums because those guys are a little touchy about that, so I just won't say it. But nobody here is not smart enough to type in certain words into Google and find forums on different topics. Okay. Uh, what you'll notice as well is that people will oftentimes post onto a forum and they will take some of these hacking tools and they will try to package them up into maybe a graphical user interface and then they will add a wrap to it and then they will post that. Uh, later on we'll go over like in another class we will go over some of the ways that they're attacking each other and some of the inside war stuff. Uh, that's one of the topics that I think would be interesting in terms of us all getting to sit down and actually seeing how some of these guys interact with each other. But that will be for a different point. So now we have here, again, anybody here ever gotten an email that had like a PowerPoint or a .doc in it or something similar, but it was actually an exploit? Yeah, I'm seeing, seeing, some, seeing some nods. Some people are like, nah, nah, never. Yep, this is exactly how they do it. It's that simple. It's a script. All you're doing is you're running different scripts. Anybody heard the term script kitty? Anybody remember that? I don't know if that's still a popular term or not, but when I was a kid, that was like a thing that, you know, you had different exploits. Um, you had uh, AOL Mail Bomber. Anybody remember that? Yeah, I see some laughing. Somebody must have broken an AOL box at least once. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's just the times have evolved. That's all it is. If AOL was still really around, people would still be running AOL mailbox bombers. It's the exact same thing. They're just scripts. And that comes back to, again, this is going to be a little bit of a rant, a little bit of a tangent here, but this is a problem that I have. When somebody tells me, you know, what do you know about cybersecurity? And I tell them, well, I'm a fairly pretty good computer programmer, and I'm fairly familiar with software development, and I know how different remote access tools work, and I also can work with uh, some of these uh, different uh, applications. And they go, well, that's not really cybersecurity, but really it is, because the tools are just written in Python. I, I've shown there, once you have a basic grasp and concept of computer programming, of networking, of being able to write software, of being able to compile, and being able to just manipulate a system in general, all of these tools have their place in legitimate system administration, and then all you have to do is figure out how to use it for bad. That's it. And they're the exact same tools. So whenever I see somebody get up and they say, oh, well, I'm a, I'm a super cybersecurity expert, I'm this and I'm that, okay, yes, but you're probably a above average computer programmer, and you probably have some experience with networking, and really what you've done is you've taken the basics, and you have elevated that to a little bit higher level and also been able to apply a negative frame of mind to it. And that's all it is. So let's look at some of these crimes. The first one I want to talk about is sextortion. 
and I have linked to Krebs huh? because this one's really interesting. Das ging. Because it's not really a rat. Das lag, lag echt but tatsächlich again, it goes back da dran. Oh, jetzt habe ich natürlich im Chat gelegt, so, dass ich Rich bin. Linux computer. 
computer or your Linux server. Never. And it's good to know that nobody here has either. Now, I want to share everybody, I want to share you all a resource, and this is from the FTC. If you go to the FTC, if you get one of these tech support scams, you can go here and you can report it. And that's a thing. Like somebody calls up and they say, hey, I want to work on your computer, blah, blah, blah. And some of us might sit there and kind of mess with those people or let them talk for a while or try to keep them on the phone or whatever. And that's fine. Like, don't do that because I work here. So, you know, be cool. But you can report that to the FCC, okay? But uh, sometimes people don't do that. So I've got a video embedded here. Uh, it's actually quite long. It's about 30 minutes. And this gentleman right here, what he did was he receives these phone calls fairly regularly at his place of business where he is a computer repair guy. And he messes with these people. And so they call and they say, hey, I'm here to talk to you about working on your computer. And he says, great, I'm so glad you called. And then he Wow, wartet mal. Sind all diese Golems getötet worden? Oder, nee, es ist nur der hier oben, der noch nicht fertig ist. Oder kann es... Kann es sein, dass die Golems nicht mehr da sind? Ja, oder? Hä? Dann muss ja jemand hier gewesen sein und die Golems... Und hat die Golems getötet, oder? What? Ja, das kann ja gar nicht sein, dann... Wer war denn hier und tötet nur die Golems und nimmt sonst nichts mit und macht nichts kaputt? Das gab es aber selber nicht. Dass die Person, die da vorne alles kaputt geschlagen hat, I don't know. And now he's relatively gentle and when he does it, he just kind of keeps them on the line and keeps them talking. So if you continue to look, this video right here that's embedded. Uh, this one's more along the lines of a gentleman receives a phone call, has a virtual machine pre-set up with attack vectors already uploaded to the virtual machine, and then using social engineering is able to convince the scammer on the other end of the line to pull a rat into his system, <laughs> at which point now he has conducted a reverse infection of the system, and at that point they really get me. And right around three quarters into the video, that's when you can start hearing people in the background of the call center screaming the words want to cry. So if you're interested in watching that video, feel free to do so. Es ist ja mega funny. Now, Warte mal, ist der Link in der Beschreibung? Das hört sich ja viel zu lustig an. Ah, die Präsentation ist aber hier. Yeah. Wanna cry. Dieses Video ist, ist privat. Uh. Okay. Also das Video gibt es wohl leider nicht mehr, aber es hat sich richtig von ihr angehört. This right here. I don't think they're in the US. Yeah, no, I don't think anybody in these videos are in the US in terms of them doing the attacks. Because they do it from somewhere else. Now, oh, this won't load here, I don't think. That's not good. So, let me, I guess I'm going to have to describe this to you all and you can look. So, on here I have a live stream. And this live stream simply consists of people doing multi-hour shifts on camera, calling up these scamming companies, and then conducting attacks on them. And over and over and over, you can see them getting into these systems and delivering payloads. You can see them getting into these systems and using uh, psychology to get these people to click on stuff. So they call up thinking that they're going to conduct an attack and gain money or get credit card numbers or whatever. And I'm going to kind of explain how this works because it's 
It's remarkable that it works repeatedly. But what happens is, is one of these scam companies will call. And they will say, your computer's broken, it's Windows, and you've got a virus, and we need to fix it. And so what we need you to do is install a remote access tool. Oftentimes, uh, they're going to install TeamViewer. But the guy has left a file on his desktop that is literally credit card and bank account information.exe. And they log in <laughs> to the computer, and the first thing you see them do is right-click on that and pull it right off the computer, right off the local box, straight to their box, and then click on it. And within minutes, you can hear the guy putting the phone on hold and talking to a partner or whatever and letting them know, okay, I'm in. They've opened it. Because we now have a reverse shell directly into their network. <laughs> and they scary. begin payload delivery. They begin going in and pulling information. I have seen a gentleman who got into a network there and actually pulled down all of their customer information and then went out and contacted all of the customers and convinced them if, if they were able to, to cancel the credit card charge. Like, they go in and do very vigilante-esque stuff on these networks, and there's tons of videos of it, and people are extremely proud of themselves. Now, I don't have a comment in terms of whether this is okay or not or whatever, but the, the see one, do one, teach one principle sort of applies here. And if you're not familiar with that, if you've never worked in medical or anything like that, what see one, do one, teach one means is you will do something, and you'll see this with doctors. So you will see somebody do something, whether it be a YouTube video, or you're gonna sit there and you're gonna watch somebody do a surgery, or whatever, but you are going to physically witness the act of doing something. Then you're gonna have to do it, so you have to demonstrate it. And the next thing you need to do is to be able to get up and teach it. And I follow C1, Do1, Teach1. That's the most effective way of getting people to learn something in the world. Nothing is probably more effective than uh, I learned that in the Guard, and it started with my combat life lifesaver class, and from there, I've used it on everything, okay? So, this is kind of the see one, do one, teach one thing. I show you stuff, and I give you access to the stuff to where you can practice it at home, in your own networks, on your own lab, and then, hopefully, each one of you goes out and makes a web page, or finds some method of being able to share that information with other people, okay? See one, do one, teach want to learn stuff, that's the easiest way to do it. So these scammers, how are they doing this? Do you really think that each one of them is using some kind of zero day in combination with a rat, and they've written their own Python code to be able to exploit these systems? No. It's not how this works. It really isn't. Because what it comes down to is they're using legitimate tools for bad. So you have access to things like Type DNC, Log Me In, Team Viewer, Windows Remote Desktop. Any of these? Anybody here not familiar with one of these? But this is sort of. In general, though, if you were to see those words, you would, you would probably have a good idea of what each one of those does, right? Perfect. There are tons and tons of different ways of remotely administrating the system. Most of us use what? SSH, thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Most of us use SSH, we do. And that's a terminal, right? And what do you also hear rats referred to as remote access terminal? So we use SSH in general, and then for certain systems, we may use something like type DNC or logging in or TU or so on and so forth. Uh, oftentimes, you'll see this used in conjunction with like people who are not computer literate. Anybody here have to do support for like family members who are not computer literate? Yeah, I see a whole bunch of hands, yep. Because you get a phone call and it's, hey, my computer's broken, what do I do? Okay, well go turn on log me in or go to this link and click here and then I'll connect and I'll take care of it for you. But you don't wanna sit there for six hours trying to walk somebody through how to like right click on the start menu or whatever? Sure. Uh, in addition, I went ahead and just threw in there, 3389 is the Windows Remote Desktop port. That's important, especially whenever we start doing forensics ports. So what, network, right? Because we have legitimate tools that can get into the system. We have illegitimate tools that can get into systems. We have all these things that are happening in the background, right? But we also, eventually, we need to start the recovery phase. Because we 
we now know how to break stuff. Like, digitally, we can kick in the door. But can we put the door back up on the keys? Can we do that? Well, the first thing we have to do is start with forensics. Now, a rat will often have a command and control center that facilitates the use of that attack. So you have what is often referred to online as a zombie, which is the computer that has been infected. And then you have the command and control system, which is the one that is going to be communicating with that system, okay? And that means that oftentimes what you will see is these attacks are going to be deployed by somebody who maybe doesn't have a lot of money or is incapable of setting up a system. So what they're going to use is a domain that's provided by a company like NoIP or similar. So there's tons and tons of places that you can go to in order to gain access to a domain that will point to a server that's within your network, like local, or to another computer, okay? Well, I must uh, kurz zurückspielen hier, weil ich ein bisschen abgelenkt war. Well, the first thing we have to do is to start with forensics. Now, a rat will often have a command and control center that facilitates the use of that attack. So you have what is often referred to online as a zombie, which is the computer that has been infected. And then you have the command and control system, which is the one that is going to be communicating with that system, okay? And that means that oftentimes what you will see is these attacks are going to be deployed by somebody who maybe doesn't have a lot of money or is incapable of setting up a system. So what they're going to use is a domain that's provided by a company like NoIP or similar. So there's tons and tons of places that you can go to in order to gain access to a domain that will point to a server that's within your network, like locally, or to another computer, okay? Uh, the younger generation, like the people who are breaking into computers to like take over somebody's Xbox Live account, they're not usually thinking about the digital forensic side, so they're under the impression that by using something like uh, no IP or a similar system, that they can execute an attack and then just turn that off after they're done with the attack. And then, of course, nobody can come back, right? Because that software is off and it's no longer accepting connections. So then they're safe. And so that's kind of the attitude that I've seen online. So let's discuss that. How do you begin tracking an attacker? So you know you have a rat on the network, and you're hoping that this person doesn't know that you know yet. So we start with Wireshark, because that's a pretty good choice. And opening Wireshark, we can then filter by you. Oh my god, Wireshark. Ich kann nicht mal mein eigenes Protokoll in Wireshark verstehen. Leute, literally. <lacht> also ich, ich finde es ja so geil, wirklich jeder immer sagt überall, öh, mach Wireshark. Aber ich kann nicht mal wirklich das simpelste auf rohen Strings basierte TCP selbst gebastelte Protokoll in Wireshark äh, debuggen, weil <lacht> ja, keine Ahnung. Also, aber vielleicht bin ich einfach auch nur zu, äh, zu beschränkt hier ähm, von, äh, von Gehirnmasse her, um, um Wireshark zu bedienen, aber also ich habe oft das Gefühl, dass Leute einfach gerne sagen, äh, verwende Wireshark. Aber so wirklich die detaillierte Beschreibung, wie man da wirklich vorgeht, die ist dann doch, oder konkrete Beispiele dazu, die sind dann doch eher immer happiger. Also ich dachte dasselbe über GDB auch eine Zeit lang, also Debugger und so. Da sagen auch alle die ganze Zeit einfach nur so, äh, wirf mal einen Debugger dagegen. Ähm, aber keine Ahnung, mit zwei Befehlen wie BT für Backtrace oder so und äh, mehr Befehle brauchst du eigentlich nicht, ne? vielleicht noch Q für Quit, ähm, ist man eigentlich schon ganz gut bedient, um, um, um damit was zu machen, aber keine Ahnung, mit einem Wireshark Filter, TCP .dest oder was auch immer, Port, IP, filterst du nach Port, filterst du nach Protokoll, nach ähm, IP, was auch immer, aber trotzdem, es ist, ist happig. Also ich bin jetzt mal gespannt, äh, wie inwiefern äh, er jetzt da ins Detail gehen würde, der, er wird der liebe Aaron Jones, was, äh, was Wireshark angeht.
Weil, ähm, klar, es ist ein super Tool, aber, äh, ne? Ich habe keine Ahnung, wie man dieses Tool verwendet. Aber ihr wisst ja Bescheid, ne? Ich habe hier immer, hier unten Wireshark in meiner, äh, wie heißt denn das? In meiner Menübar, um hier zu flexen, dass ich irgendwas kann oder da immer bereit bin, dieses Tool zu verwenden. Ähm, aber, Leute, keine Ahnung. Wirklich keine Ahnung, wie das geht. Okay, Filter bei okay. DNS. So once we filter by DNS, what we need to do is find an odd domain name. Hopefully your network is quiet, or as quiet as you can get it. Hopefully your network is quiet. GG, wenn ich irgendwelche Server am Laufen habe und da Leute drauf connecten. Warte mal, Filter bei DNS? Was soll ein Filter bei DNS überhaupt heißen? Don't want a whole ton of traffic or else we're going to have to be much more careful on the way that we set up our search in Wireshark. But if there's not a lot of traffic, what we're looking for is things like badaction.noip.com. <laughs> These are odd, strange domain names. Oftentimes those domain names will just have a whole ton of characters. They kind of look like an onion, like a dot .onion account. Uh, they have like a hash or something similar. But you're looking for something strange. Now this is where we get into that I can't tell you exactly what to look for because every attack is going to be different. That's just how it is. But Warte, what I can tell you is what you're looking for is you're looking for strange. You're looking for weird in the noise. If you see uh, images.google.com, that's probably not where your rat is coming from. Because if it is, we've got bigger problems. Okay? But if we see something like .oip.com or we see uh, .reverse.dns.com happy.com like once you start seeing these odd strange items that's what you need to focus your search on once you have that domain name then we can run ns lookup on the actual domain and from there we're going to get an ip address and especially if they're using that ip address for a in their home well that's going to come back in addition to that Warte mal, that is that no TPS, kann das sein? Ist das nicht mein Internet, sondern der Server? Vielleicht machen die anderen ja gerade Faxen. Hier gibt es ja wirklich absolut keine Protection gegen irgendwas. Ähm Leute, ich schau mal kurz in die äh, Auslastung vom Server. Ähm Wenn euch das jetzt dann doch interessiert. Falsch. Da ist von der Smaller Client. Ach so. Ähm. Äh, wie ist denn die Usage? Ich weiß gar nicht, wie das... Er verwendet schon viel CPU. Ähm. Ja, keine Ahnung. Ich werde das jetzt mal nebenbei laufen lassen. Ah ne, ist es immer noch? Die CPU Usage sieht irgendwie gut. Ich kenne es die normale Idle CPU Usage auch nicht, muss ich sagen. Ähm hm. 
Naja, momentan ist es noch spielbar. Aber wenn das so weitergeht, also wenn das, also wenn jetzt die Leute wirklich irgendwie Lag-Machines bauen oder so, muss ich vielleicht äh, den Server ein bisschen upgraden. Ähm, ja, laut Hausmaster, der Owner von 2 b 2 t äh, irgendein Reddit-Post von dem, bringt, uh, er bringt in Minecraft die Single-Core-Performance, äh, die Multi-Core-Performance gar nicht so viel. Das heißt, wenn man mehr Cores hat, bringt das gar nicht so viel mehr. Weil irgendwo wahrscheinlich einer der Hauptthreads dann nur auf einem äh, äh, Core oder Thread laufen kann. Ähm Und ich weiß nicht, ob ich so leicht eine, einen höheren Clockspeed bei meinem äh, Anbieter momentan bekomme. Ich könnte mir mehr Cores holen, aber... Aber eigentlich ist das System nicht wirklich ganz ausgelastet. Ja gut, jetzt geht's ja auch wieder. Ja, keine Ahnung. Also ich lasse es hier mal. Äh, dann kann ich das Video nicht sehen, wenn ich das hier monitor. Äh, naja, egal. Das wird dann später zurück. Because one of those domain name servers is going to still have that IP address attached to the domain and you're still going to gain access to that. Now once you have that IP address, then what do you do? Vielleicht ist es auch mein Internet, kann halt natürlich auch immer sein. Ne? It depends. If, uh, oftentimes what you can do is you can take that IP address and then you can find out who the service provider is. Okay? Or throw it in Shodan and see where they're located, potentially. You have a lot of different options there. Uh, for those of you who are worried about this stuff at home, What do we also need to start thinking about? Monitoring our traffic, right? That's kind of the big thing here. We want to know what's actually happening on our networks. Don't have to if you don't want to, but show of hands, is anybody monitoring their network at home? A few yeah. of us? Wie Probably denn? less than Also, mit was denn? Okay. Kommt auf an, was man halt unter Monitoring versteht. So, how much do you keep that in mind? Does everybody here only have one computer? Uh, right? Devices. So what do we probably have? We have game consoles, right? We've got computers. We have Internet of Thing connected devices like televisions and posters and cameras. <laughs> Toast and we have uh, phones. We have children's toys. We have Ew. things that probably shouldn't even have like an Internet connection to it, but they've got dogs, like collars and stuff. Everything has an Internet connection. Walkity and the Cyber. What is this? Is that a talk? A Blu-ray player, sure. Your television, your you have your watch, your everything. Everything is connected, right? And so we have tons and tons and tons of devices that are all communicating simultaneously on our network. And the vast majority of us, even in this room, as advanced Linux users, are not monitoring our network. So if I were to ask you what communicates with what on average when and what can you tell me about a baseline for your network, most of us would not be able to tell. What is my baseline? How often does my webcam or my home security system contact the manufacturer? Why would it send out a message once a week and then start sending out a message once a second? Those are questions that we have to be able to ask, but we wouldn't be able to ask that if we don't know what's really going on on our network at any one time. So, I'm gonna... <lacht> GG, das kommt jetzt natürlich geil getimed, wie ich auch gerade nicht wusste, was die Average Load von meinem äh, Server ist, <lacht> von der CPU Usage, weil man da eigentlich, man fängt nur an, irgendwo reinzuschauen, oder was heißt Mann, also ich und vermutlich auch viele andere Leute, fangen erst an, in irgendwas reinzuschauen, wenn die Kacke am Dampfen ist. Und dann wundert man sich, äh, ist das immer so schlimm? Oder Ja, also... Äh, ja, da hat er schon recht, der, der Aaron Jones. Schauen wir doch in dem Zuge direkt mal rein in die CPU-Usage und die ist immer noch verdammt hoch. Also sie ist jetzt bei 60... 60 Prozent... 
Zen, oh, warte, aber ist das überhaupt der Minecraft-Prozess? Ja, schon, ne? Ja, die ist jetzt bei 60 Prozent. Vorher war sie kurz mal über 120, aber jetzt ist sie auch kurz auf 90 hochgedroppt. Also, der Server läuft jetzt noch Töfte. Ähm, jetzt schießt sie auch ein paar Mal hoch, also. Ja, jetzt 120, ja, schnell einen Block abbauen. Ja, nein, das war nicht, also, daran kann ich das nicht ablesen. Okay, gut zu wissen. Danke, Aaron Jones, für diese Ermutigung. Mal zu monitoren, wenn nichts los ist. Er hat zwar nicht von der cpu usage von dem Minecraft-Server geredet, aber ne? Oh! Ist fast fertig, ne? 54. Alternative Open Source Firmware für Ihr Wireless Network. But in addition to that, for these devices, they often also have hardwired stuff. So it's sort of holistic in that it will help you with controlling your network. Because there are tools here that you can use for monitoring your network, for finding out what's going on, for being able to see traffic. In addition, we all run Linux, so we all have the capability of running an absolute myriad of tools that can help us with figuring out what's going on. You really can't forensically analyze your network and figure out what is actually going on if you don't know what's going on before you're in the middle of an attack. Okay? You don't want to be trying to figure out how to put your boots on and load your rifle when somebody's already dropping mortars on your head. That's not where you want to be. That's not the position that you want. Okay? So, this is kind of pre-built stuff right here. Okay? You can go onto this webpage and you can even go down to like Office Max And they have DDWRT routers, okay? Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, Office Max carries Linksys, and Linksys is now starting to put DDWRT into some of the routers. And so, like, even just, you head on down to Office Max and then stop in to get something to eat at the local restaurants, and, like, that's where you can get started, okay? So that's why I put this up here, because that's a way of being able to better control your stuff. However, if you're interested, you can use a Raspberry Pi. I do. I have one. So you can take a Raspberry Pi, add two Eddy Max Wi-Fi dongles to it, and you can use that as a wireless access point, and you can send your tools through that wireless access point and use that to sit there and sniff and pay attention to what's happening. It's slow, and you can do better with better hardware, but if you're on a budget and you don't have a whole bunch of stuff that's going to be moving through that network, then that's a way to get started. So if all you have is $45 and you want to get started, you can get started with building your own using a Raspberry Pi. And if you have $175, you can go out and buy a Linksys and start with that DDWRT. Okay, so I'm not putting anything out there that would be outside anybody's budget, I hope. But what does that mean? Again, we have to be multifaceted. We need to understand networking. We have to understand what's happening on my network. Why do these things happen? Who's communicating with who? Do I have a way of keeping logs? Can I analyze these logs? What are some of the tools that we can use? How about Splunk? Some of us familiar with Splunk? We Never can take heard logs, of them. We can help them in Splunk and then we can pay attention to them there. How about another one, Elastistack? So there's that tool for you, okay? Really what you're doing in business and at work, that really does translate to home, okay? And it may even be more important at home than it is at work. Because you need to be able to be concerned about your family. You need to be able to know uh, about your children. What are they doing? Where are they surfing? Do you have the tools on your network to understand where kids are going on your network? Like each one of these things are concepts that sort of build off of each other. We talk about big things in here because that's sort of what we're at. We're at a police department, right? And so I like to tell you all about the the gory details and the, the bloodshed and the murder and the guys who are tracking people down all over the world and we talk about all that cool stuff but we forget about the fact that yeah we have kids and we have somebody that we have to worry about who's getting onto our network and we need to know where they're going or what they're doing now everybody here knows that while i like tools and i like scripts and i like computer programming and i like all that stuff what do i always tell you all if you're going to learn how to use a tool need to learn how to make an alternative, right? So let's talk about GNU Netcat. 
because GNU Netcat is pretty neat. And it's a great tool if what you want to be able to do is troubleshoot and work with network connections and uh, troubleshoot the TCP IP protocol. Okay? GNU Netcat, super awesome tool. Man Netcat or Man MC. Okay? Comes on an endless number of distributions. You have Netcat everywhere. Okay? Uh, whether you're running FreeBSD or you're running Debian or you're running Arch or Parabola, whatever, you probably have a copy of Netcat. Okay? So what can you actually do with it? How about if we are in PowerShell on a Windows computer and we want to expose a shell. So we have gained access to a Windows computer. We can type in NC, switch L, switch P, 8080, switch E, command.exe. And if we do that, what we have just done is we have opened up a server on port 8080 that exposes command.exe. Would you say that that is a security vulnerability? Yeah? An administrative tool. It is an administrative tool, absolutely. So really what you could do with it is maybe tell command.exe that we need to do some updates, or we need to work on our system in some way, or we could also delete system32 or whatever the cool thing is that kids do this nowadays. So with Netcat, you potentially don't have to be an administrator. Uh-huh. Sure. So I think my assumption here is is it will run it as the user. And then if you were to elevate, then you can elevate to your sudo or, or whatever the alternative is for Windows. I can't remember what it's called. But then that window would open up on the desktop asking if you want to allow the admin to run a command. And it would be... So same thing. I'm going to move running low. So same thing, Linux. NC, switch L, switch P, 8080, dash E, and then bin bash. And so you can expose bash. Again, you're going to expose it as the user, not as the administrator, for sure. I can tell you for sure on Linux, you're only going to expose it as whatever it is that you have elevated to. Okay? So under Windows, can't tell you. Linux, for sure. How about exfiltration of files? If you're on a system and you need to get a file out of there, what is something that we can do? Well, with Windows, we can type pipe and then file.doc, and then we can pipe that into NC and then an IP and a port. Okay? On Linux, we can do something very similar. We can use cat. Cat file.doc forward slash, or I'm sorry, uh, pipe NC IP and port. And then we can download hmm, that. File. So NC, switch L, switch e, the port, switch EU1, and then port. Uh, uh, the, the less than, yeah, the redirect, file.doc, and then the greater than uh, redirect to dev null. And what we're doing here is we're exposing the file, and then we're downloading the file all using the cat. So this behavior is similar to what? Just a rat, right? That's all we're doing. We're exposing different aspects of the computer to being able to gain access to items. And of course, is there anything wrong with that? We do it every day, right? Everybody here uses SSH? Everybody here uses SFTP? Anybody here actually use Netcat? Yeah, some of us? Okay. So the exact same behaviors also, that we do every SFTP. day are just the exact same behaviors so that as any of these rack provide you as any of these other tools. It's all the exact same stuff. It's just intention, right? Was that so good? All it is. <laughs> That is kind of good. So we're getting close to the end, so it's time to start a fight. Windows or Linux? Right? Is Linux more secure than Windows? And people ask this all the time. And there's tons and tons of arguments about it online. Okay? And no matter where you go, some people will say that Windows is more secure. Other people will say that Linux is more secure. 
uh, there's other arguments that say that, well, the reason why nobody breaks into Linux computers is because there's nothing important on Linux computers. <laughs> <laughs> Stuck. So, what does Linux really do for us? Well, let's start with least. Well, also, man can, also, man can es auch so sehen, dass nichts Importantes auf Linux Computern ist, insofern, dass, ähm, die Mehrheit der Leute einfach Windows verwendet und ähm, wenn man die Mehrheit der Leute holen will, dann äh, holt man Sachen auf, auf, auf Linux und wenn man an sich die Mehrheit holen will, dann gibt es weniger Mehrheit auf Linux und so gesehen weniger zu holen auf Linux, aber äh, das ist schon sehr weit hergeholt, aber ja, an sich natürlich äh, eine geile Aussage. When you install Linux Oftentimes, you're installing it in a method that provides you with least privilege. You log in as a user, you can do work, you have access to a very small area of that server or computer, and then if you need access to more, then we do sudo, right? We elevate privileges. And for every person in here that's... Wobei, nochmal hier einhaken, ähm, das Witzige daran, in the first place, auf, auf Linux gibt's nichts zu holen, ist ja, dass ja eigentlich alles... Also die richtig wichtigen, okay, das ist natürlich auch schwer, schwer zu sagen, aber ich würde mal sagen, der Großteil der, der richtig wichtigen und juicy Sachen läuft ja auf Linux. Ich meine, weil die ganzen Server Linux sind. Aber also ich habe jetzt vom Desktop-Bereich geredet, aber im Server-Bereich, ähm, das ist natürlich das äh, natürlich sehr interessant äh, an Daten, die da zu holen sind. Und das ist natürlich alles Linux. Also also, äh, aber es ist ja obviously, wir brauchen eigentlich gar nicht drüber reden. <lacht> Common knowledge, and it's, a, it's an idea that we all have wrapped our head around, because I don't think a single person in here has sudoed up to run a command. Now, on Windows, what do they have? They have something similar. They have the UAC, right? So you try to run something, or you try to run a command, or whatever, the UAC comes up, and it asks, do you want to do this, yes or no? And then you hit yes. And I don't think I've ever worked on a single computer, except for like one at work, that you have to guess and then type in a password for the UAC to function. Most systems that I've ever seen, the UAC pops up and it says yes or no, and you just hit yes and then everything's cool. Because most people run their system as what? Administrator, absolutely. The, your average user, the vast majority of Windows users, They run as an administrator account. Again, show of hands, but you don't have to answer if you don't want to. Does anybody here run their computer normally as a user under Linux that does not have access to sudo? Sometimes? Okay, so we've got like two people that are kind of like, yeah, sometimes I use a user that can't sudo up. Okay. Services. But. Yes. Yeah, there's guests. Yeah. There's all kinds of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> So, the vast majority of us, we can sudo up, but we all have what? A password, right? I don't, does anybody in here able to run sudo without a password? Ja, aber was für ein okay. Passwort? Hä, so ein sudo-Passwort, was, was man die ganze Zeit eingibt, wie stark ist denn das? In general, ja. under also, Linux, because... Ich rede hier jetzt nicht nur von mir, ich, ich meine, ich sehe das ja, wenn, wenn Leute ihr Passwort... Okay, ich schaue jetzt nicht auf die Passwörter und so, aber ich meine, man hört ja, wie viele Keypresses das sind und wie schnell die Leute das eintippen können und so weiter ähm, in Präsentationen, in YouTube-Videos, äh, wenn man unterwegs ist, äh, überall äh, in den ganz, ganz, ganz seltenen Fällen klingt das wie ein stabiles äh, Passwort. Klar kann man das auch nicht so gut brutforcen und hast du nicht gesehen, aber pff, ja, ein Passwort ist besser als nichts, aber ich finde dieses dieses Sudo-Passwort ähm, oder auch an sich das Passwort zum, zum Gerät, was man ständig eintippt überall, wo was man ständig hört. Ich meine, alleine ich habe jetzt in dieser Videoserie mein Passwort sicher mehrfach, okay, vielleicht in der Serie jetzt nicht wirklich, aber gerade wenn man äh, Tutorials macht äh, oder so, in, dann gibt man ein Passwort ein und dann ähm, sieht man vielleicht nicht die Anzahl der Zeichen in einem Video, aber wenn der Sound von der Tastatur zu hören ist, dann, äh, 
dann hörst du die Anzahl der Zeichen und natürlich eigentlich auch irgendwie die Zeichenabstände, also die Tippabstände und so weiter. Dann, wenn man in der Öffentlichkeit unterwegs ist äh, und, keine Ahnung, in irgendeinem Internetcafé sein Dings eingibt, da kann ja auch jeder über die Schulter schauen oder äh, eine Überwachungskamera kann das sehen. Also ich will jetzt nicht hyperparanoid klingen, aber ich meine, wenn man mal überlegt, wie oft man dieses Passwort eingibt, je, mit jedem Mal, mit dem man das eingibt, wird man ein bisschen sicherer oder nachlässiger in, in, beim Verstecken des Passworts. Also niemand tut so äh, irgendwie wie bei, bei der Bank, Kreditkarte oder so, wenn man da sein, seine PIN eingibt, dann hält man da wenigstens ein bisschen die Hand drüber, aber niemand gibt irgendwelche Fax, äh, Fax wenn man ein Sudo-Passwort eingibt. Ähm also ich bin natürlich auch selber betroffen von, von dieser Krise, also wenn ich irgendwo im öffentlichen Platz bin und mein Sudo-Passwort reinhacken würde, äh, reinhacke, würde es mir nicht auffallen, wenn, wenn irgendein Dude ganz auffällig über meine Schulter starten und das Passwort gesehen hat. Also das, das würde ich nicht mal merken. Und ähm, es ist besser als nichts, aber pff, keine Ahnung. Das Passwort muss man sich merken, weil man gibt es ständig ein oder je nachdem wie oft halt, wenn man Updates machen will oder irgendwas machen will, ähm, Sachen installieren. Also ich mache das häufig und ich nehme an, viele andere Leute machen das auch häufig. Äh, mit jedem Mal verliert man da ein bisschen Sicherheit an dann dieses Passwort, das vermeintlich alles schützt, also das ist halt die Frage, wie, wie, wie viel Sicherheit man darauf äh, jetzt setzen will. Ne? At least privilege in the way that things work. If the system is compromised, generally, and now this is not always the case, because you have things are group hit. Ja gut, also ich meine, für, für automatisierte Attacken, wenn, wenn ich auf irgendeine Datei klicke, auf die ich nicht klicken sollte, was auch immer, ähm, dann weiß diese automatisierte Attacke natürlich nicht mein Passwort. Also das ist schon klar, aber äh, ja, also für den Fall macht das auf jeden Fall Sinn. Ich denke, dafür ist es auch, auch gemacht, aber <lacht> so an sich, wenn ähm, Ja, nein, also für den Fall macht es auf jeden Fall Sinn, also keine Frage. Aber die Person, die ein, wenn, also wenn man gezielt angegriffen wird, ähm, dann denke ich, ist es nicht so schwer, an das Sudo-Passwort äh, zu kommen. Also wenn man das schafft, bei einem Linux-User eine, eine, eine Malware irgendwie drauf zu bekommen oder so, ähm, und den gezielt angreift, dann denke ich, ist es nicht so schwer. Äh, an dieses Passwort zu kommen. Just, just saying. The ability to uh, elevate privileges, and there are attacks on Linux. However, generally, if my system is compromised, I will lose the information that is relevant to my user. Okay? If, um, if you go online, most people who get crypto locker on a Linux box, particularly system administrators who are running things like uh, Apache, Their system gets crypto lockered while running Apache. What ends up happening? Somebody uploads a file that they're able to get Apache to run, and then Apache goes in and it locks all of the files that are available to Apache, and then nothing else. Right? Everybody familiar with the concept and where I'm going? Okay, cool. So, your vast majority of internet using computer, Facebook people. Our method is very convoluted. You have to run the program, you have to sudo up, you have to give permission, you have a lot of things to pay attention to. There's this footprint that you have to look at and you have to be able to see every piece of it before you're able to. Ja, ja, klar. Nee, es macht es auf jeden Fall äh, umständlicher. Ne? Ich, ich sage nicht, äh, dass es nichts bringt und ich sage auch nicht, ich habe eine bessere Lösung. Ich will nur mal hier ähm, äußern, dass dass es nicht die ultimative Sicherheit ist und dass man ständig überall eigentlich potenziell sein Passwort äh, liegt an Leute, die eben, äh, sagen wir mal, mehr oder weniger live dabei sind, während man sein Passwort eingibt, was natürlich auch irgendwo Sinn macht. Aber irgendwie habe ich das Gefühl, dass Leute das halt... Vor allem, keine Ahnung, wenn man bei, 
bei der Defcon oder so auf der Bühne ist und aufgeregt ist und nicht auf alles achtet oder was auch immer und Kameras auf einen zeigen und Leute von allen Seiten auf einen schauen, ähm, dann und da dann sehen, ruhig sein Passwort einzugeben, finde ich halt krass. Finde ich halt krass. Und dann geht man äh, von der Stage runter, lässt seinen Laptop da auf der Bühne natürlich gesperrt, also ist alles sicher und äh, besäuft sich da voll und dann kommt der Erstbeste aus, aus der ersten Reihe und gibt da das Passwort ein und dann ist er drin im System. Ne? Also. And for a long time, you would get your computer and then people would tell you to take your UAC and just turn it off. Has anybody been told that lately? No, not lately? That's good. Because there are tons and tons of exploits right now that automatically run software that if you have the UAC turned off, they just auto run. And they will go from beginning to end, full installation, without ever having to touch it simply because the UAC is turned off. So if you're not using the UAC and you're running a Windows-based computer, you need to turn on the UAC because that is a massive security exploit just waiting to happen if you don't run the UAC. However, Wobei, daraus sollte ich mir ein bisschen TNT again, machen. Das wäre das wär sicher nice. They conduct almost all business administrators. And that is why something like cryptoware is so devastating with Windows. You're running as an administrator account. You or ABC always be clicking. And what do they always click? Yes. Nine times out of ten, they will click yes instead of no. So when something pops up and it says, do you want to crypto lock everything? They hit yes. Like that is what is happening on these systems. Now in here, I talk about how Windows does attempt to emulate something like a behavior that's very similar to pseudo and that there is the UAC and all of that. But I want to point you to the Steam support form. And this person right here is asking, why does it seem like some games want me to run as ad? And if you follow through here and you actually read all of the replies, they're mind boggling. The things that people will go in here and say, well, you need to run as the administrator for the system play this game because the UAC blocks it. And so they're accessing enough stuff that we need access to everything. Everybody knows what's kind of a scandal that's semi in the news right now with Steam in terms of people are installing games and then finding out that these games are coming with malware. And the malware is specifically designed to gather information from people's computers as they're using Steam. So they want your emails, your contacts, everything that's going on on the system, and they're doing that in order to maximize profits. So they sell you the game, and then they make extra information by selling the information about your computer. Yep. Never trust a forum entry. So... Never trust a forum entry? Because they are doing these things, some of these systems need full administrative access to your computer. Anybody here still running Windows simply because of games? Yeah. Everybody's We've got a bunch of people also here Minecraft läuft super Windows, auf Linux und T-Words äh, läuft auch äh, super, ne? Kann ich äh, kann nur sagen. When you need to run Steam and you need to install these games, well you're getting malware that's coming straight from the factory. And you can go look into that if you'd like. There's specific names and specific companies that they're attached to. There's a whole bunch of things that are happening in the Steam community that revolves around that. And these users are ABC, they're always clicking. They're saying yes. So even though they're receiving information that says, this is malware, it's pulling information about your computer, they're downloading your contacts, they're pulling your emails, they're pulling passwords, they're pulling information from your browser. They're doing all of these things, and every time you click yes, that is what is going out of your system to somebody's system overseas. People are still saying yes because the carrot and the stick, right? If the carrot's big enough, People will still click yes, no matter how big that stick is. And it comes down to games and entertainment. Now, personal opinion. And if you don't like it, make a comment on the video. Because that's how we're going to trick you into commenting. Mm -hmm. 
I do personally believe that Linux is more secure than Windows because it does require a certain level of technical acumen to deploy. You have more tools available to you to secure the system. You require a greater level of skill to use the system, and you are less likely to have knowledge gaps that allow scammers to exploit you. And I do not know of any person reporting to me that they have received a support center call targeting their Linux box. Ja gut, aber das ist natürlich auch wieder, weil weniger Leute äh, Linux verwenden. Also, es, es ist, also die Leute wissen ja nicht, was für eine Maschine man zu Hause hat, meistens. Die gehen ja einfach davon aus, dass man äh, Windows hat, weil einfach der Großteil der Leute Windows hat. Also das ist ja, also das ist nicht wirklich ein Argument. Äh, nur mal hier. Ich, ich sag jetzt nicht, dass Windows sicherer ist, ich sag nur, dass die Leute deswegen das machen, weil ein Großteil der Leute halt einfach Windows verwendet jetzt ein Großteil der Leute Mac verwenden würde, würde das äh, würden die Anrufe auch auf Mac-User abgezielt sein. Ähm ja, und selbst wenn ein Großteil der Leute Linux verwenden würde, würden die trotzdem auch sagen, hey, sie haben einen Linux-Computer zu Hause. Ähm ja, also ich denke, ich habe meinen Freund schon bei der Hälfte von meinem Gebrabbel gemacht. Also, whatever. What I do want to make a comment on as well is Linux has a 100% market share of supercomputers and is installed on between 70 and 90% of all servers connected to the internet. Ja, aber nicht auf den Desktop Computer, da wo die Leute anrufen. Linux computers is incredibly diverse. And the belief that no one targets Linux due to their poor market share seems inconceivable when the amount of data and the value of it is vast. And I believe there is a difficult factor to attacking Linux systems that is ja, gut, aber die Systeme, wo, äh, wo Linux läuft, das sind halt äh, die, die Power-User-Systeme. Und ich meine jetzt nicht der äh, average Linux Desktop-User, äh, der hier wie ich rumsitzt. Und, also, das ist ja kein krasses System, aber so, äh, so Server oder Supercomputer oder was auch immer. Ähm, die werden ja dann doch großteils schon gemonitort und da sitzen dann äh, Systemadministratoren dahinter, die sich auskennen. Aber wenn man jetzt ähm, nach Systemen sucht, die einfach zu, zu erreichen sind, wo, wo Desktop-User dran sitzen, dann ist da der Großteil doch, doch Windows und nicht mehr Linux. Die, die einfacheren Ziele. Der, der Großteil der okay. Privatpersonen halt. Ne? So you're absolutely right that the home market share is dominated by Windows. Tons of people use Windows and ja. they are ABC. Always be clicking. Ja, genau. They are generally not technically literate. They are not familiar with their operating system. They're not familiar with the attack vectors that could potentially affect them. They're not trained and they don't show up to this room. They're just, they're not here. They're not here. They're probably not watching the videos at home. And 20 years later, when people are still watching this and going, wow, look at all this retro stuff, they're probably still not going to be the same people. However, there is plenty... Ehre an ihn, dass er denkt, dass in 20 äh, Jahren noch jemand seine Videos schaut. Aber würde ich ihm gönnen. Also, ich muss sagen, mittlerweile äh, fast schon Fanboy hier, so viele Videos, wie ich von, von Aaron Jones gesehen habe. Ähm, auch wenn es sich so oft immer wieder wiederholt, aber irgendwie ist, äh, macht er macht eine gute Show, ne? kann man nichts sagen. Ähm, aber trotzdem äh, bezweifle ich, dass gerade so ein Content in 20 Jahren ähm, nochmal geschaut wird, aber ich lasse mich gerne von, vom Gegenteil belehren. Das sehen wir dann in 20 Jahren. Valuable information out there on servers. There is plenty of information out there and people are attacking them. They are able to deliver cryptoware through uh, tools like Apache. They are finding methods to be able to put... Aber wahrscheinlich hat er das nicht wirklich auf sich persönlich bezogen, sondern so mehr auf... Uh, oder hat er? Keine Ahnung. Attack these systems. Hat sich wahrscheinlich nicht so viel dabei gedacht. If not secure your system, they will exploit it, and then they will be able to gain something from it. Like it is... We know it. We've seen it. It's in the news. So they are out there and they are looking. But... If you are getting to a point where you have set yourself aside by moving to Linux and you have started to develop your skills and you are paying attention to the computers that are around you and you are paying attention to what you are doing, you have already elevated yourself far beyond 
your average user, and you have really reduced that footprint of attacks, like seriously reduced it. So let's discuss some of our answers here. What is a rat? Well, a rat is a tool used to facilitate the remote control of a device over a network connection. Full stop. That's a rat. Remote access tool. What does it do? It facilitates facilitates communication between two computers over the network. That's all. There's no connotation there, right? The rat is not the crime. The rat is not the bad behavior. It's not the bad actor. It's not the criminal. The rat is just a tool. What is sextortion? Well, sextortion is a crime that can be facilitated by a rat. You gain access to a system. You elevate to the point where you can turn on the webcam. You sit there and you remote find somebody in a compromising position or otherwise embarrassed, and then you provide that information to them and you demand money. Okay? How are they built? Well, they can be written in a multitude of languages. What can we do? We could write a rat with netcat and bash, right? Something as simple as that. Or we can use Python, C sharp. A rat can be written in a multitude of languages and frameworks and is often served through the use of a Trojan horse or social engineering attack. The rat is not the only tool. It's a, excuse me, it's a step. That is what it is. The rat is a step. It is not the end all. It's not the be all. It's not the beginning and it's usually not the end. It's just a step in the full attack. And are there legitimate uses? for rats. Absolutely. A rat can be used to provide legitimate repair services to users who may need remote help. We've probably all done it. Family members. You gain remote access to a system. You assist. You disconnect. No crime. No foul. Nobody's hurt. So, the only thing I can tell you is, is a remote access tool is not necessarily an evil or bad thing. Now, you can deploy many different tools for a myriad of positive reasons. However, we must also understand that for every tool that we have that can help us in the wrong hand, it can be used to cause harm. I've said it before, I'll say it in every single class. If you have access to the tool, learn how it helps you and learn how it hurts you. Because every single one of these tools can potentially be a weapon. It's just intent. That's all it is. <coughs> Scammers and criminals target individuals in the hopes of causing harm or gaining illicit financial gain through the use of a disparate exploit and attacks brought together to weave a battle plan together. Now we must be cognizant that remote access of computers is a normal and everyday occurrence. However, we should also understand that the use of remote access to cause harm is not normal and we should not tolerate it. Now, your basic understanding of how an operating system works, how users can interact with that within that ecosystem, and how networking functions are all valuable skills that can they all work together to uh, increase your capabilities. I'm telling you, it's a holistic approach that you have to take. You can learn about a rat, but if you don't know how to deliver it, it doesn't do you any good, right? And if you don't know how a network works, once you have access to a system, are you going to understand how to be able to move from computer to computer? Are you going to understand how that network is built? How communication is happening? What tools are being used? Do you even know what to look for? You have many, many, many skills that you have to be able to use to be able to do any of this stuff. So learn about these tools being deployed, read their source code if possible, and practice in a safe environment to maximize your learning. Everybody here has a some form of lab, right? Yeah? If you don't have a lab, you can make one. You can use QEMU, you can uh, use VirtualBox, you can use VMware. Yeah, there's tons and tons of different ways of being able to build a lab. If you don't have a lab, I urge you to do it because it gives you a good, safe environment to be able to practice. And you can add Windows to a virtual machine, okay? And you're not trying to play games or do anything like that in your lab, so it's a perfect place to be able to practice each one of these tools and techniques because all you have to do is be able to elevate or gain access to the system. That's all you have to do. So what are my final recommendations for each of you? Well, obviously use Linux if at all possible. If you're on Linux, you've already taken, taken a step towards that personal security. Gain a better understanding of how the underlying OS works in user space. How does your operating system function? What tools are available to you? What is pre-installed on the operating system? If you were to go onto a server, 
uh, and you were to run, you name switch A. What are you going to see? Well, I'm looking at it, and it says Debian. So what normally comes with Debian? What tools are available to us? These are the things that you want to familiarize yourself with, right? Build your toolbox. I showed you a whole bunch of pre-built rats, right? And these are exploits and, and all these different tools within the new net tech. That's a simple, basic tool that is included with almost every single operating system that you're going to see installed on a server. And you can use it the exact same way. So somebody else can. So if somebody were to gain access to your system, even if they don't necessarily have a file that they have uploaded, if they are smart enough to be able to run good netcat, could they potentially exfiltrate data from your server? Yeah, they could. And continue to read about vulnerabilities. Read the news. Read about accounts. When I showed you each one of those news accounts, what do they usually put in there? Names, right? They'll name these attacks. They'll name drop. Most of these places, they want to impress you with their knowledge. So they're giving you information about the attacks and who's involved in it and what kind of companies are being targeted. All of that is pivot points for OSINT. OSINT being open source intelligence. So you sit there and you read that news article and you find out that there's a new attack and it's called blank. Well, that's your research pivot point. You start with that name and you find out what servers it's affecting, what company, so on and so forth. It's, I can't, this is the one thing that I can't teach you. I can't convey investigative abilities. I can tell you about tools. I can tell you how they work. I can give you all kinds of different information and I can just shove that out there. But the one thing that I cannot do is interest you in the act of actual open source investigation. But once you have mastered that skill, that is 90% of everything else. Once you gain a grasp on being able to pivot from information to information in order to build up your toolbox and your knowledge base, you will become what amounts to unstoppable. So we've got a few minutes to close up. Uh, does anybody have any questions? So, uh, have you been using this tool called Exploit? It's got on there reversed shells. Mm -hmm. Is that the same thing as a, as a rat? Uh, essentially, what it is is it obviously a framework as per the name, to deploy it's a reverse shell. So, once you're able to install so, this, it's similar to Netcat. Oops, that's not funny. It had not after uh, Meta. Uh, nach Metasploit itself gefragt, sondern nach dem Tool, was er damit deployed hat. Hey, wann überhaupt? Was? Meint er in einem anderen, einen anderen Talk, oder? Wann hat er den Metasploit verwendet in den letzten zwei Stunden? Ich habe wirklich keine Ahnung. Then you can connect to that shell and then you have shell access to the computer. So it is a tool that would be available within a rat, but I wouldn't necessarily call it a rat but it is a function of a rat. So the rat would provide you the ability to open up that reverse shell. I see, I can it. Okay. And again, that's where we kind of get into semantics. I want to make a comment on that if people are thinking. Because, like I showed you, Netcat, the new Netcat, it's a reverse shell. But then I can go all the way up here and we could pick Quasar or Knat uh, or Fat Rat or any of these tools, and they're all going to offer you a reverse shell. So it's just a, it's just a behavior. That's all it is. What it boils down to is it's, a, it's an available behavior. Anything else? Yes. If you say OSINT is the main thing, the main tool for your investigation, then what would be a method of improving that? Like improving your OSINT skills? Yeah. OK. So methods that I would recommend for improving your OSINT skills is uh, one of the first things that I would do if I was going to start today with all of the stuff that is available to me. I would urge you to go out and there are places on the, on the internet that you can go to that uses heuristics and uh, artificial intelligence to automatically summarize articles for you. Okay? Uh, you'll see, anybody here ever been on Reddit? of us okay I'm, I'm dead serious I've been in places where I've asked has anybody ever been in reddit and people are like what's the internet <laughs> like okay so you can 
if you ever get on Reddit and you look at that, you will find that sometimes you'll think, see a thing that says this is summary bot. And what summary bot does is somebody posts a link and summary bot goes and grabs that link and then gives you like an X number of sentence summary of what that link is about. Start with something like that because it'll allow you to like very quickly uh, triage data. So you can start with Python, which this is what I do. I mean, this is, these are tools and techniques that are available to you today that I wish I had five years ago. But you can start with Python to be able to start pulling down news articles, and you can use RSS feeds still, and then you can start pushing all of that directly into uh, any of those summary tools. And there's some open source ones, there's ones that you can install on your own computer, and there's also APIs that are available. And so you can immediately start accessing data in summary form and very quickly triaging through it to see if it's applicable to you. Combine all of your skills, like Captain Planet, your computer programming, your ability to summarize things, all of your outside the box thinking, all of that stuff has to come together for you to just be able to take articles and just slam through them until you find something that sticks out to you, that oddity, just like if you were looking through Wireshark and you're looking for a weird DNS. You're taking all of that data and you're applying it over and over and over again until it becomes something. Um, I've done it, I have, I have been involved in investigations in which I looked at a picture and I was supposed to find a person in that picture and using nothing but the metadata from the picture, like including stuff happening in the background, uh, actions that are taken by the person, and then stuff that was in a bag, I was able to identify the person and pass that information off to other investigators and was like, this is the person, I was able to find them online, here's all the reasons I was able to do it. Oh my god, I have never heard anything since You're taking all of that data and you're applying it over and over and over again until it becomes something. Uh, the fire shark stuff has to come together, skilled. Let's do it to see if it's applicable to you. Same data, and there's also APIs that are available. Okay, so, and so da you can immediately start dabei. accessing data in summary form and very quickly triaging through it to see if it's applicable to you. Combine all of your skills, like Captain Planet, your computer programming, your ability to summarize things, all of your outside the box thinking, all of that stuff has to come together for you to just be able to take articles and just slam through them until you find something that sticks out to you, that oddity, just like if you were looking through Wireshark and you're looking for a weird DNS. You're taking all of that data and you're applying it over and over and over again until it becomes something. Um, I've done it, I have, I have been involved in investigations in which I looked at a picture and I was supposed to find a person in that picture and using nothing but the metadata from the picture, like including stuff happening in the background, uh, actions that are taken by the person, and then stuff that was in a bag, I was able to identify the person and pass that information off to other investigators and was like, this is the person, I was able to find them online, here's all the reasons I was able to do it. Going off of that, something else that you need to learn to be able to do is to be able to express where you got it. The, the term that you're going to hear, like, sort of pandered around is forensically sound. And so what you want to be able to do is if somebody asks you, how did you do this, you need to be able to explain it. So that means note taking, detailed note taking. Once you start looking at that malware that you're investigating, write it down. Time. Dates. What is it doing? Who is it communicating with? What kind of um, IP addresses are it, is it connected to? Who is it communicating with? Because all of that information will be important later if you do your investigation and somebody takes over that bot and starts pointing it towards doing something else because of a hostile takeover and they switch the IP addresses. And so now your bot goes from a, a communicating with one server to another server. And it's just being able to pay attention. What do we talk about with our own internal networks, right? Do you even know what's going on on your network? You have to know what's happening. You have to be able to describe what's happening. And you have to be able to see the difference. You've got to be able to diff it. So what does that boil down to? Text files, right? And diffing those text files. Von da ist ja noch ein Golem da. It's just, ich habe das doch fertig gebaut, it's oder? It's 100 years worth of information that I'm trying to cram into an answer that's like three minutes long. But it's just attention to detail, just like you would learn in the military or anywhere else, 
It's attention to detail, a willingness to write things down, and to use all of the tools available to you to be able to make something that you can express to somebody else. See one, do one, do one. You've got to be able to explain what you did to somebody who might not even know how to turn a computer on. Make sense? I hope that's a okay answer and you know how to hit me up. So you can reach out to me and I can explain more later. Anything else? No? Well, I want to thank you all for coming out here on your Thursday night. Thank you so much for attending and I hope this was of assistance to some of you. Wow. Das war mal wieder lang, das Video, hey. Jesus Christ. Ähm, ja, aber ihr wisst Bescheid, ne? Video ist vorbei. Äh, somit auch diese Folge der Dauerwerbesendung. Ähm, also meiner Meinung nach fast die spannendste Folge bisher. Also für mich die höchsten Hochgefühle, die hier aufgekocht sind, äh, wieder bei dieser Base vorbeizuschauen. Ähm, herrliche Sache auf jeden Fall. Ähm... Lustiger eigentlich als die Folge, wo ich äh, von diesem Berg runtergesprungen bin und einfach abgekratzt. Das war natürlich auch sehr funny. Aber ähm, ja, ne? nicht vergessen, hier auf diesen Fun, Fun, Fun Server zu kommen. Ähm, hin und wieder steigt dann wohl doch hier eine Part. Ich habe mir ja gesehen, heute waren ja fast äh, sechs Leute oder sowas online. Ähm, erreichbar unter der IP-Adresse 149.202.1.7.134 ähm, oder der Domain sillyhoon.com. Keiner weiß, was länger hält. Ähm, falls sich was dran ändert, werde ich das in der Videobeschreibung äh, ändern oder zur Not könnt ihr mal auf den Channel klicken und schauen, was das neueste Video ist. Also zu, äh, wenn ich zu faul bin, durch alle Videos zu gehen, das zu ändern, dann ähm, werde ich vermutlich, falls es eine Änderung in der IP und in der Domain geben wird, ähm, ein, ein neues Video hochladen, also bei den, bei den neueren Videos. Ich gehe jetzt mal davon aus, dass ihr dieses Video in der Zukunft seht. Ähm, dann könnte es sein, dass, äh, ja, dass die neueren Videos halt in, äh, die neueren IPs in äh, neueren Videos sind. Ne? So, äh, macht auch Sinn irgendwie. Ne? Ähm, genau, und sonst das Video, was wir geschaut haben. Äh, den ersten Teil dazu gibt es in der letzten Folge. Es ist auf dem Channel Brian Clough. Äh, Link ist, ist wie immer in der Beschreibung. Und der Vortrag ist äh, von unserem Polizeifreund Aaron Jones ähm, mit dem Titel Introduction to Rats Rem äh, Remote Access Trojan Slash Tool. Und dann würde ich sagen, sehen wir uns in der nächsten Folge dieser Dauerwerbesendung wieder. Kommt rein. <lacht>